This program is brought to you by Emory University. So we're going to talk about cancer treatment. And today would have been the 78th birthday of one of my very best friends, uh, Dr. Victoria Finnerty. She was a biology faculty member, and she died of ovarian cancer. Um, and so that's Vicky in her lab, and she's working with her flies, which she loved more than anything. Uh, and Vicky was a classic example of something I'm going to show you in just a slide or two. Right? Ovarian cancer is a disease that does not have early detection, and it does not have symptoms uh, that are distinctive. So what happens with ovarian cancer is women will say they feel bloated or, you know, their appetite is off, or it's a bunch of other vague things, right? The nothing where you would say, oh, you have cancer. Uh, and, and so that's what happened with her. She literally had all of those things. And they did an ultrasound of her and said she had cancer. And she lasted around 10 years, which is, for her stage and condition, was extremely good in part because she was able to uh, get in what is not an official clinical trial, but she was able to use, utilize a vaccine, an autologous vaccine made from her own tumor. So it turned out that the pathologist that got her sample the day she had her surgery recognized her name on the specimen uh, because she had taught him. And uh, he thought, well, maybe she's going to want some of this tumor for something else. And so instead of putting it all in formalin, she kept some of it kept some of it out in saline, and so it was usable. And they were actually able to make a vaccine with it. Unfortunately, after taking it for a long time and doing sort of against the odds well, she stopped taking the vaccine. And there's no particular reason why that happened. Um, and then the cancer came back, and she died. Um, so, uh, but today, Today's her birthday, so it's a good time to think about her. And uh, in her honor, I'm going to go on a rant for you. Because no one dislikes smoking more than her. Her husband died of lung cancer. He quit smoking the day he was diagnosed. But prior to that, he wouldn't even go out to the movies with us because he couldn't go two hours without smoking. Right? Uh, that was too long for him to go. And one of the things is culture. Right? It needs to be ingrained in the culture that smoking is bad. So here is a cover. Do you recognize this man? Right? Michael Douglas is what? Who is he? He's an actor, right? So, so he's an actor, and this is him, I think, in the 90s. The year's on there, but I can't read it. I think probably 1999 or something like that, it says. So here he is. Look how damn suave he looks, right? On the cover of Cigar Aficionado. He doesn't look so good there, right? So here's when he was diagnosed with throat cancer. Cigars are just so glamorous, aren't they? Because then that tobacco and the juice just goes down your throat and gets on your lips and your tongue and causes cancer, okay? Uh, so he sort of learned his lesson, and he sort of actually at this point, many years later, obviously just from looking at him, right, he's a lot older, uh, that's part of the issue with smoking is that the effects aren't seen until later. If you picked up a cigarette and immediately threw up a lung, you wouldn't do it again. But there's that delay, right? There, there's a long delay uh, at, between the exposure and the, the negative consequences. And so when people start when they're young, they think it's not a big deal. But it's not really his fault, right? Because did Michael Douglas even know this was bad for him? Right? We didn't know anything about that stuff, right? Or did he? <laughs> right? So here's a publication uh, on the uh, cautioning against the immoderate use of snuff. It's from 1761. He was born after that. Right? So clearly, clearly we have known for a very long time about this. Okay? So at least now we would never glamorize tobacco use, right? We wouldn't do that anymore, would we? Heck no. Could he be any more suave? 
He makes Michael Douglas look like a geek, right? Michael was all alone. This guy's got a babe who I don't even know what she's doing there with her hand. I don't know what's going on, right? But, but he, he looks really happy, right? It hasn't gone away, right? The, the culture of it has to change, right? And you guys are in position to do that, right? To just tell your friends, whatever, uh, this is not something that's appropriate. All right. I just want to remind myself. All right. Okay, I'm ready now. So now we're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to talk about cancer treatment. Okay? The father of chemotherapy is Sidney Farber. And, and he's the person for whom the Dana-Farber Cancer Center is named, and he is the one that's in the documentary that you've now had more time to watch. Right? Uh, so uh, you'll hear about him, right? He was a driving force in the development of cancer, especially in pediatric cancers. And just to show you, uh, he used folic acid antagonists uh, such as aminopterin and, and methotrexate, which is an inhibitor of uh, an enzyme. Uh, then they use them to treat children with leukemia. They saw suppression, and the, but the disease returned. It was still one of the first times ever when they could actually see any big benefit of treatment. So at the time, it was a big breakthrough. And I just want to let you know that science is a stutter step, right? It doesn't always go plowing straight ahead. And so at first, there was actually a paper, this was from 1945, right? So three years before Farber did his work, uh, but he was certainly aware of this, about the fact they were saying that you could treat the leukemias with folate as opposed to an anti folate, right? They were trying to treat it by essentially giving it more nutrients. Folate is used in the, in the production of nucleotides, right? So uh, what they were trying to do was uh, give more folate. They thought they were sick and maybe we could fix them if we gave them more, and they got some results. I don't know how, um, but it doesn't always work, right? Uh, Farber, that first, uh, when they realized this started, people tried to do it, then they were like, well, hell, we're making things worse, right? And then they said, well, what if we block folate? Uh, in the 50s and 60s, there were more uh, folate antagonists, uh, which used in combination were the first thing ever shown to cure any cancer, right? other than surgery, which we'll talk about, which is different. Right? Uh, so they were able to cure acute lymphocytic leukemia, or ALL, which is otherwise rapidly fatal disease. Okay? In 1962, uh, and we'll come back to this. I'll show you. In 1962, there was a, a big project where the National Cancer Institute sent out uh, people to collect plant specimens, botanicals, all kinds of things, and tried to screen all kinds of stuff against cancer. And one of the things that was discovered was uh, this a bark, actually, that came from the Pacific yew tree. And ultimately, it was the source of a drug called Taxol, right, which you may have heard of. And we'll talk about it a little bit. But just remember the date, right? 1962. Uh, in 71, uh, it was the publication of the structure of it. 93, how long did it take then for Taxol to go from an interesting chemical into treatment? Yeah, yeah. You just do the integral. Yeah, no, right? Yeah. So a long time, right? 31 years. It took a really long time. And, and that, honestly, that timeline is better than it was. We don't take 30 years normally to go from this is an interesting compound, an, a compound of interest, into the, into the clinic. But it still takes typically 10 or 15 years. Right, without uh, reasonable, that, that's a reasonable thing. It takes a long time. In 1997 was the first monoclonal antibody that was used to treat cancer. It's called rituxan or rituximab. Uh, my father-in-law just finished being treated with that here at Emory. It works great uh, and has very few side effects, essentially almost no side effects from his perspective. 
uh, really good. One of the first hormonal treatments is tamoxifen, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So that was approved in 98. 2001 was the first of the targeted therapies. Again, we'll talk about all of these in more detail. I'm just giving you a brief timeline, right? Sort of put it in perspective. And 2004 was the approval of the anti-angiogenesis drug, Avastin. So this was the first drug that was not really targeted at the cancer. It was targeted at the stroma, at the vasculature, right? Uh, first one, okay? So to, to go back uh, to, to when this started, in 1971, Richard Nixon, uh, in his State of the Union address, uh, said uh, with, that he was going to ask for $100 million if you... If you Read the Emperor of All Maladies. They don't talk about this a lot, I don't think, in the documentary, but they talk about a lot of more of the backstory in the book of the po po politics, right, behind this, and the wealthy people who were getting behind this saying we need to do something, uh, influential folks. And so Nixon said he asked for $100 million to, to launch a very intensive effort. He hoped that they would cure cancer in about 10 years. Here's his sound bite. We've long been the wealthiest nation in the world. Now it's time that we become the healthiest nation in the world. And uh, this is 100 words, so a million dollars per word, right, was how much he, how much he spent, right? In uh, December of 71, he signed the National Cancer Act into law, and he said that he hoped that when everyone in the future looked back on his administration, they would recognize that as the most significant thing he had done, which is clearly debatable at this point, right? But, but, uh, but the National Cancer Act, the war on cancer, did give the National Cancer Institute, right, one of the National Institutes of Health, Right? That's a collection of institutes. So the National Institutes of Health, NCI, is one of those. And it gave them a lot of latitude, a lot of free uh, will of what to do with the money. Right? It's still politicized. We still do budgets based on lobbying and things. But uh, the NCI has more autonomy than others. And uh, they've been around since then. So is it possible to cure cancer? Is there a cure for cancer? Probably not, right? Probably not. Um, so, but people have pushed it for a long time. So this is a, a cover from 1998 saying no more cancer, right? Special report. Here we are in 98. Here's from 2013, right? A few years ago, how to cure cancer. Gesundheit. And, and one of the things that came out of this that wouldn't have happened here is that there was a big backlash, right? Is this the worst magazine cover of the year? Why can we do this to sick people, right? It, it's, it's disingenuous, right? It's not necessarily fair to them. You're giving them hope that they shouldn't have and things like that, right? So people uh, bitched about it. And then uh, this year, President Obama, actually more driven by Biden, who has a family connection, obviously, with cancer, launched the moonshot. You're aware of this, right? This just started this year, and uh, this is the new war on cancer. Are we closing in on a cure? Uh, people just don't learn, right? Uh, so this is actually from ARP. Uh, so elderly people probably more likely to really want a cure, right? Because we know who gets cancer, right? Elderly people primarily, okay? So what is going on with deaths from cancer how are we doing, right, in, in curing people? So uh, if you look at age-adjusted deaths in males uh, from year, so this is from 1930 to 2003, certainly the things are a little better now in the last 13 years. I'll show you some more modern graphs, but the, the general trend is, is there. Uh, we get lots and lots of deaths, a uh, huge increase uh, in lung cancer. Why? Why? Why that time frame? Yeah. But why, why then? The war. It was the war, right? It was World War II. Uh, so they used to send cigarettes to, to, to the soldiers and stuff, right? They got, them, they got them to smoke. And honest to God, I think if I was in the trenches somewhere, I think I'd be puffing too, uh, right? You, you don't really think in the long-term health effects at that point, right? So... <laughs> 
So uh, a lot of people came back addicted, right? A lot of people got addicted to it, and then Woman's Lib set women back around 20 years difference between the same curve occurring in women, right? Because they wanted equality, and we want to die from lung cancer too, by God. So they started to smoke, right? And, uh, and so the woman's curve follows, lags behind like that. And then it goes down because better, better treatments are, are being found. Some cancers, like stomach cancer, the, it goes down exponentially. Why is that? What causes stomach cancer? We talked about one of the things. H. pylori, for instance, right? The bacteria. And also, uh, there's smoked meat, processed meat, nitrosamines, right, in the diet. Uh, and so both of those things are controllable, right, with antibiotics or just by not eating smoked meat and things like that. There are some countries where stomach cancer is still very, very prevalent because of the way that they cure meat and things like that. Right. And uh, some cancers are going up. Uh, this one we'll talk about in a little bit. So survival has gotten better for many, but not all cancers. So here's, uh, uh, some curves are great. The, the curve goes straight up. Some of the curves go up very sharply, but I'll show you that that's misleading, okay? Um, and, and for some, I'll get you in one sec. And, and, and in, in some cancers, from 1972 all the way to 2007, it's changed almost not at all, right? So it depends on how amenable to treatment the, the cancers are, right? Some of them, like pancreatic cancer, flat, right? About 2 or 3% survival at five years or something like that. But with uh, some cancers, it's, it's, it's much, much better, right? And uh, uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, melanoma is one that's going to go up again, right, because of the treatments we'll talk about. But Yeah. But that's not liver cancer. But um, what, what I mean, like, it seems like it can be like preventative cancer and stuff like that. Because like, it can But it's, it, it, that is where you do get primary tumors in the liver. Most of those are associated with smoking, da -da, alcohol use, uh, and infection with one of the hepatitis viruses. <coughs> Right? If, you're, if, you're don't, if you don't have one of those risk factors, then liver cancer is relatively uncommon. Um, liver tissue is weird, and it forms in cystia, and there's all kinds of reasons why you wouldn't necessarily get it. Um, but it is a good place for metastasis. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is uh, another way of looking at it. So this is in men and women. Here's relative survival estimates. So pancreatic cancer is the worst uh, for five-year survival. Uh, testicular cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, much, much higher. Right? And again, this isn't to be memorized. I'm just letting you take a look at, at this, right? Uh, please don't, don't do that. <laughs> right, just, just get the idea. Okay. Childhood cancer is one of the best exceptions. So for most of the, of the ch early uh, cancers, the cancers that occur in children, uh, Wilms tumor, Hodgkin lymphoma, acute a ALL, the one that we just mentioned, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, a lot of them, the survival has gone way, way up, right? Very quickly, uh, between 1940s, when Farber first started doing his work, let's say, and now. Um, the, the curves are very different than for adults, and it's not completely, totally clear, right, why they're so good, uh, why they respond so well. But there are some indications. One is that the biology of the tumors is probably different. Uh, these are, the, a lot of the tumors that arise in children arise from developmental tissues that kind of don't do right, right? You don't stop growing when you're born. Uh, they have some, some abnormalities, so you get non-ectodermal origins, a lot of them. The tissues are immature, right? The, the tumors can arise from residual embryonic tissue. And because of that, uh, they respond to treatment much better uh, for whatever reason. They are more responsive to the chemotherapy. 
The other thing is that children are extremely resilient and they can take doses of chemo that you can't give an old person. Right? So they literally just tolerate treatment better so we can hammer them harder. Right? And they, they just, they're, they have younger cells, they're just more resilient, they just don't get as sick. Right? They just bounce back faster. I mean, anyone who has a younger cousin or brother or, or neighbor or something and they get sick and then they make you sick, they get better faster than you, right? You're the one that's like on your butt laying there for a week and they're like, hey, yeah, you're like, thank you, right? Uh, so they, they bounce back. They just, they just have a better, their immune systems are better. I don't know exactly, but they're better. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's true. I mean, so, so her question is, should we then be slicing off the really old folks, right? Um, uh, but that's just not the way it's done. I mean, that's a great question. Yes, I think you would see something different, right? Uh, but that's, the way the trials are done, the way the system is set up, you're either male or female or child, i.e. 18, under 18, or, or older. That's pretty much it. And that's probably economic, right? Because when they do trials, they don't want to do trial on another group and have more data and more testing and everything else. But that's just the way it's done. Okay. And the other thing with kids is clinical trials. So uh, enrollment in clinical trials, and, and we're going to have the head of clinical trials for the Cancer Institute is going to come talk with you right at the, at the end of the class, uh, Dr. Basil L. Reyes, and he'll talk with you in much more detail about it. But suffice it to say that enrollment in adult clinical trials, right, trials for adults, is pitiful. It's like 1% or something, right? It's very, very low. Whereas when it comes to cancer in a child, parents will do absolutely anything, right? Uh, and so almost all children will get put into a clinical trial uh, if one is available for them, and adults just don't do it the same. They just don't, don't, don't look at it the same way. And probably that's one big reason why they, they do better. Uh, yeah? Does the same rule, uh, same principle apply that Uh, cancer uh, patients? Uh, well, a lot of the cancers that kids get are, by definition, the leukemias are very aggressive. They tend to be very aggressive. And maybe because they're aggressive, maybe one reason why they respond better, right? Because we know that we're going to talk about what we want to do is push them over the edge, and they're already more closer to the edge. So, but yeah, I mean, when you're talking about a little kid, they'll do standard of care, but it's, I think the bar is different for trials. But, but you can ask him that. Ask Dr. Arias. He'll, he, I mean, that's what he does. Yeah, yeah. I'll write it down if you don't ask him. So the key here is to, to catch cancer really early. Uh, and so uh, the earlier you get it, the more likely you are to be able to treat it and get a successful cure, right? an outcome to actually cure. So this is a World War II poster. Uh, about it, and, and I was actually looking for, I saw it one time, and I think it's like gone from the internet, that Adolf Hitler, which I, talk, I think I talked with you about that, right? That Adolf Hitler was a huge proponent of early cancer detection, and there were all these posters where he was extolling people to, to look for cancer early and stuff like that. Um, he lost his mother to breast cancer, and he was just terrified of, of cancer. Uh, so World War II is like, I think, a big turning point, right, in people realizing, not, not just because of that, but in part, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it varies with age, right? So there's national panels that do recommendation for when you should be when you should be examined. I mean, they should always check your skin, right? There's no reason not to look for moles, right? And document them. If you have moles, by the way, young people, everyone has moles, right? So if you have a mole, I'm going to give you a good idea. Maybe it's nothing. It's probably nothing. I'm just trying to make you paranoid. 
But here's what you do. You take a dime or something, and you put it next to the mole, and you take a picture. And then you have a reference forever for the size. Right? And then over time, if it changes, that's when you worry. Right? Uh, but if you don't have a, a size reference, then how far you are it makes it look big or little, right? So, you, oh my god! <laughs> It's huge. Yeah. So so put put your dime down there or something, right? So you can so you can follow stuff. Uh, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Okay, so here is a key. Here's an example. Ovarian cancer, right? Vicky's cancer. Uh, it, if it's if it's caught when it's early, right? Uh, then oh, sorry. If it's caught here when it's late, right? Oop, I'll get this right. If it's caught when it has spread, right, about 62% of people are detected at that point. Because there is no early test, because there are no symptoms, right, there, it's not caught early. Uh, there's not a facile way to screen for, for this cancer. And people that are caught at that stage, which is m the majority of people, have a 27% survival at five years, right? But breast cancer, the almost exact opposite, 60%, 62, 60% of people are caught when the disease is very early. And for people who are caught very early, there's a 98% survival, right? Again, in ovarian cancer, if you were to catch it early, you would still have a 93.5, almost 94% survival. It just doesn't happen that much, right? So we need better detection methods, right? Which is why they were talking about that with melanoma, right, in their paper, right? We want to develop panels that are specific and sensitive, right, for, for the cancers, because it makes all the difference. There's, like I, I mentioned this before, but there's a reason why there's all kinds of breast cancer fundraisers. There are over two million breast cancer survivors in the U.S. alone. Pancreatic cancer, you don't see too many walks, right? Why? They're dead. It's, it's pretty clear, right? I mean, that, that, that's sad, right? But that's the truth, right? Uh, there's a huge lobby for some cancers. Survival is really good. There's good lobbying, marketing. We would need more money, et cetera, et cetera. And the people around. If people die, lung cancer. Not only is lung cancer survival bad, but it's stigmatized. You got cancer because you smoked. You deserved it. Right? And so legislators are much less likely to put aside money for that, right? Yeah, Cole. Um, what's it mean by unknown or unstaged? Oh, they, 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 just don't, they just don't know. They're unable to determine the, the stage, right? They just they don't know. Sometimes you can't tell. You find that you don't know exactly where it arose or how long or anything like that. That happens. Happens in melanoma a lot. Yeah. Say it again. Metastasized yeah. Like, oh, because this is like 27 and that's 23, you mean? It would depend on the cancer. No, because if you did the same graph with pancreatic cancer, the survival would be 3. Right? At 5 years. They're, they're very unlikely to be around. Yeah, they actually did transvaginal ultrasound, and, and right, so which sounds every bit as, as uncomfortable as it was. And uh, what they were able to do was to detect that the blood flow through her ovaries was being impeded by that. And so from that, they determined that there was a mass there. So why is that so that's why she went. It's really super uncomfortable. That's not something that women would do. No, no, no. I mean, it's, I think it's a different level of uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, clearly, if testicular cancer was detected using an equivalent test like a mammogram, there'd be a better test, right? Uh, I think that's, that's clear. But, and so they're working on that, right? There are already better tests, which I'll show you. But yeah. I mean, the, the test for ovarian cancer, 
there's not a screening, there is an antigen that people monitor for ovarian cancer, but it's a pretty bad one, bad marker. Yeah, Daniel. I mean, they're going to go down uh, depending on the cancer. For some cancers, like colon cancer, if you make it past a certain time point, they sort of say you're, you're in the clear. And for breast cancer, they don't say that. Right? Because we know some, cell, some of these cancers just tend to hang out longer than others, right? Sort of micrometastases, and they'll recur later. But it really, it really depends. It's so personal, you know? I mean, there are data, I'm sure, but I don't know them by heart, whatever, but there's for it. Yeah. So detection has gotten much, much better, OK? Uh, and so the, the, the question then, which we'll talk about briefly, is better always better? <laughs> right? Do we always want better? And I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. Sometimes better isn't always uh, helpful. So there are some, some uh, uh, parameters, essentially, of diagnostic tests. And this is not just cancer. This is any test you get. If you go and you get a cholesterol screening or you get anything, right? There, uh, any kind of medical test, there are some parameters. There are things called false positives and false negatives, which are just what they sound like. False positive, we say you have something and you don't really have it. False negative, we say you're in the clear, but you actually do have it. Right? The sensitivity essentially identifies how good is the test at identifying people who actually have it. If there were four people in this room with a particular condition, sensitivity says I find all four of them. Right? How good at I, am I at finding the ones that actually have it? And specificity is, tells you how good the test is at identifying people who don't have it. So for instance, if in that same test, if I screen this, the class, and I find all four people that have the condition, you with me so far? But I also flag four other people who actually don't have it. The test is sensitive. I found everyone, but it's not very specific. I also found people I shouldn't. Does that, that make sense? Yes? Okay. And uh, likewise, if I only found three people out of four, but I didn't flag anyone else, you would say the test isn't as sensitive as we'd like. We missed one in four. But it's very specific. We didn't accidentally include anyone, right? We didn't rope anyone in. Does everyone with me on that? So you will need to calculate that, I promise. I will have a problem on your final for you. Is that fair? Can't get any more clear than that, right? Hey, blindsided us with that, right? OK? So you will have a thing. Here are, here are your uh, tutorials, right? So we have very nice tutorials on Cancer Quest for this. It's not hard math. You guys can do it. Uh, and you have to figure it out. But this increased sensitivity in detection really influences treatment. And we'll talk about that, right? These things, sensitivity and specificity, make a big difference. And it's something that patients don't know about and they don't, they're not educated about. Their doctor's not going to tell them, I'm going to give you a test, but it kind of sucks, right? I had one of those for years, PSA, which I'll show you in a minute. I had it every year with my physical. And then I switched doctors, and he was like, we don't do that anymore because it sucks. It's like, well, why'd the other guy do it? I don't know. Copay. I don't know, right? Um, but but that you're not always informed, right? So you need to be an educated consumer, and you need to ask, how good is this test that I'm getting done to me, right? How much can I rely on it? Lekha, do you have a question? I mean, what people, well, you want both. I mean, you really need both. You, you, you can't have one without the, right? So the, I'll talk about it in a moment, right? I'll show you, what, I'll show you an example. Did you have a question somewhere yeah, here? I was just wondering what good numbers would be. I mean, at least 95, right? I mean, you want it to be at least, I, I don't think you're going to want to miss more. Than, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the more the better. So here's, here's a, a great example. So 
Here is a time frame, 1973 to 1999, incidence in breast cancer and prostate cancer over time. And uh, you, what you'll see here, and this uh, is right around 1990, 1990-something, early 1990s, people just really started getting prostate cancer like crazy, right? Huge change in behavior. No. What happened? They introduced that shitty test, right, that I took, right? It's called the prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, test. And uh, so people said, well, this thing is produced by cancer cells, and so we can monitor in the blood, and we can look for PSA. And if someone's PSA is elevated, then we have a reason to suspect that they have cancer. And then they go in, and they start looking at all kinds of people that they never would have looked at before, had no symptoms, no reason to suspect anything for prostate cancer. And lo and behold, actually, when you look in enough people, you start to find more of it. And here's the thing, and we'll talk about this with breast cancer. It's a big ongoing debate now, right, is that maybe these cancers would never have done anything ever to that person. But now we found it early. So now you go to the person and you say, what, we did this test, and now we think that you uh, may have prostate cancer, but don't worry about it. That's cool. We're not going to do anything. What's your response to that? Right? <laughs> you can see how well that would go over. Right? So the problem with the tests, which are getting more and more and more sensitive, and the same is true for mammograms, right? That's, a, that's actually as big a deal as uh, prostate cancer because mammograms are more and more and more sensitive now. They went from x-rays to digital to CT, spiral CTs, and all kinds of things that you can do now to detect breast cancer. We're finding cancers when they're very, very, very small. And the idea is that many times they may do nothing whatsoever. But once you tell someone that they have cancer, then you start treating them. And the outcome can be nothing. Maybe it's very minor. Or maybe uh, in, a, in a man, maybe you cause permanent urinary incontinence or erectile dysfunction. Or in a woman, you disfigure them. Or they get an infection from the surgery and have some kind of horrible uh, sequelae, right? We don't know. But that's sort of where we're at now. Yeah. That's a, I, don't, I don't know. They're pro I don't know the answer to that. That's a, it's a great question. I would assume it has to be in the 90s, right? I mean, they're not going to approve anything that's not that high, right? Because when you're talking about the cost-benefit analysis of identifying a bunch of people who have to go through a bunch of extra tests who didn't have it, right, that's a huge problem. It's a big economic problem, too. Yeah. Yep. Right. So, he, so here's what we have to do. What we have to do is to be able to detect and distinguish. Right? You don't just say this is an early stage breast cancer. What we need are the, the tests that will say this is an early stage breast cancer that is likely to progress or this is an early stage prostate cancer that is likely to progress, right? Or not progress, or whatever. That's what we're working on now, right? That's, that's where we're, we're headed with this, right? So uh, the, the data is very clear that PSA testing can lead to further procedures. Uh, you're, you're elevated. So what do they do if you have an elevated PSA? What's the next thing they do? Biopsy. They start shoving rods into you, right? They start taking little cores out of your prostate. Uh, and, and that can go bad, right? Something can happen. Even in colonoscopy, you can get a perforated colon, right? It's rare, but if you're the one that it happens to, it's not good, right? So there's always a, a, a something you have to weigh, right? There's always an analysis that you should make. Uh, and breast cancer, here is a, a study that was done, and they say new breast cancer exam nearly quadruples detection of invasive breast cancer in women with dense breast tissue. So 
young women are the women who have dense breast tissue, right? Older women, the tissue tends to become less dense, less dense, less dense, less dense. Okay, got it. Got it. Right? And so this new technology, it's, it's very difficult. The reason that, that mam mammograms are done the way they are, the reason they squash your breasts, right? If you don't know, guys, uh, how this works, uh, they take uh, the woman, you put your breast in between essentially glass plates, and they lower it and squash the breast down, and they can do this to men. You have to be a talented technician, but you can do it. <laughs> okay? Uh, but it's done. But they squash the, the breast tissue down to flatten it out as flat as possible, which is where the discomfort part comes in, right? That's not a comfortable thing. But the reason they do that is to make the tissue as thin as possible so that they can see abnormalities that would other get, otherwise get hidden, right, in that thick, dense tissue. That's the purpose, right? Uh, and so the, the imaging is getting better. And we're finding more and more cancers that are probably smaller and smaller. And therefore, a lot of them are very likely to not have done anything. Um, so uh, that's really causing problems and changing sort of the paradigm of how even this cancer is treated. Right? Maybe we should watch it. Right. OK. Lung cancer, lung cancer, I'm having some real issues today. Lung cancer screening right, uh, is another thing. This is much newer. Uh, people have uh, done studies to show that now this is not general population. This is usually screening of people at risk, i.e. people smoke, right? Uh, so these people are at elevated risk. And so what, what they're learning is that you can do CT scanning, right? Uh, which is computed tomography, which is essentially a bunch of x-rays, right? Uh, where you can re re reconstruct it in 3D. And they, they do think that they can save some people with this. This one has a lot of problems with false negatives uh, and false positives. And if you have a false positive CT, then they do biopsies inside your lung. right? And the chance of dying from that is actually not too bad. Uh, so it's, it's actually pretty risky. Okay. So the way things are going, and I said this to you before, I'll say it again now, this is what you guys are going to do in the clinic. It's going to be liquid biopsies. This is the present slash future. Uh, and we're not going to be stabbing into people's prostates and lungs anymore. Uh, we'll be taking a simple blood test uh, or even breath test or poop te sample, right? right? Fecal sample, right? Uh, and so these, uh, this blood test spots recurrent breast cancers. You can monitor response to treatment. Uh, this is a way to look at uh, circulating tumor cells to have direct treatment therapy. Uh, and this one is looking at stomach cancers to try to identify circulating tumor cells or CT, circulating tumor CT DNA, uh, and combine CT DNA and cells uh, with the exosomes that we already know about and you have extremely powerful now ways of looking in without uh, punching into someone. And what we need now is to come up with panels that will distinguish between those cancers which are indolent, i.e., they're not doing anything, versus those that are going to progress. Right? And that's up for you guys got to work this out. Because right? I'll be old then, and I don't want punches. I want so a little finger prick would be nice. I'm OK with that. Right? Something easy. Right? So this is the first non-invasive DNA screening test for colorectal cancer. It's called ColoGuard. Uh, and it detects the presence both of red blood cells, which are caused when the fecal stream causes those polyps to bleed, as well as uh, looking for DNA mutations that can indicate the cancer. So looking for APC mutations, things like that. Right? And amazingly enough, in the in feces, with all of those dead cells and all of those bacteria, they're still able to find that. Amazing. Right? Uh, so so this, is, this is here now. Okay. Now, the, the major types of treatment for cancer. Right? There is surgical oncology, surgery, the surgical oncologist. There are drugs, which is the field of medical oncology. There's radiation. 
obviously radiation oncologists, bone marrow transplantation, and more and more common now is complementary and alternative medicine. Complementary meaning you go along with the Western standard of care kind of treatment, at least in the US. An alternative means that you don't do that. You reject that and do something different. That's much less common, of course. But complementary medicine, that is uh, adding herbs or adding other kinds of things uh, in addition to the standard treatments is actually really common. Uh, and treatment can be either curative or palliative. You can either want to cure this person, you get rid of the cancer. Palliative cancer treatment was, is mostly done to alleviate symptoms, uh, pain for the most part. So for instance, if someone has metastases to the bone, that hurts a lot. The bone metastases can really hurt. And so they will treat the person with radiation to reduce the tumor burden just so it doesn't hurt. But they know they're not going to cure the person, right? Palliative care. So surgery. Uh, surgery has been around a really long time. So this is a picture of uh, someone that had a very large growth, benign growth probably, right? Otherwise they'd been in more trouble uh, uh, on, growing off the side of their face uh, and they had it removed. Uh, surgery, uh, here's one for a mastectomy where they essentially use a saw, uh, it looks like. Uh, uh, and then they just tie you up with rope to hold everything. <laughs> So to hold everything in. So surgery is not always pretty. Um, but if you can remove all of the cancer cells with a surgery, you're done. Right? You're done. End of story. So someone has melanoma, like the guy I told you, my, my ex-student went in, he had melanoma. They cut it out. They looked. They said it's not deep. Done. No follow-up. No radiation. I mean, of course, he has to get his skin checked but nothing for that particular thing, right? That's end of story, right? The same is true for early breast cancer and for, and for a lot of other things, right? You can cure the person. Sometimes people will have additional treatment to be careful, but if the surgery is done right and, and early, you don't really need it. Yeah? You, you, that's, yeah, I mean, metastasis can occur early. It's definitely true, but there's a lot of cancers where people, it's found early, they go, they cut it out, move on, right? Um, that, that's, that's, just how, that's just how it works, right? So the, the next thing, surgery is pretty clear, right? Either you got it all or you didn't. Right? It's pretty clear, so I'm not going to have to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, but the drugs are different. Right, so what do you want in a cancer drug? Right, if, if, you're the, if you're the patient or you're the pharma company or whatever, you may have slightly different ideas. But what do we want? We want one that's highly efficacious. You need a drug that does what you think it's doing. You want it to kill the cancer cells in the case, uh, or at least stop the cancer from growing if it's something that's attacking something else. Right? So we want to stop, we want it to work. We want it to have low toxicity. And here, which we'll talk about, is where almost all of the cancer drugs developed from the 40s all the way up until the late 80s or so, all of them fail this. Right? Uh, they're very toxic. They're very, very toxic. Some of them, they work, but they also are very toxic. Uh, we want it to have good biological availability. What does that mean? I'm sorry? There's not something in a particular So, but no, biological availability, not commercial availability. So in the body, what would, what would make something more or less viable? Yeah. So, but what, what controls it? So biological availability, what does that mean? What if you have a brain cancer, for instance? It's hard to get things into the brain, right? So if you can't get the drug into the brain, plus the blood-brain barrier, that's poor biological availability. It is not available where you need it. Maybe this drug is lipophilic, and it aggregates in fat, uh, but you don't want it there. You want it somewhere else, or vice versa. You want it in fat, but it doesn't go there, right? Or it doesn't really accumulate in the kidneys to high levels because it's excreted or something, right? So it has to get where you need it, bottom line, right? And then it has to last a reasonable amount of time. And reasonable, of course, is uh, subjective. But think about 
the drugs that you take, pharmaceutical, like so prescribed drugs, that is, right, that you take, right, uh, like aspirin. You take it every six hours or eight hours or 12 hours, right? And, and then the half-life goes away. There are medicines you take once a day. But there aren't usually things where they go like, well, take this in the first of the month, right? And it's going to kill pain for the whole month, right? So you don't necessarily want this thing to last too long, but you also don't want to, to tell someone that they have to take a pill every hour, right? So the half-life has to be reasonable uh, so that dosing can be reasonable. Uh, and you need a facile route of administration. So again, the easiest is oral medication. You take a pill, that's the easiest thing. Most of the drugs that chemotherapy, most of the cancer patients uh, now take intravenous drugs. Right? The newer drugs, a lot of them, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the targeted drugs that we'll talk about, they're oral, right? the small molecules. But most of the classic old school chemo drugs are intravenous. So would you take an IV drug because you had a headache. Would you go and get a six hour infusion for your headache? No. Would you do that if you had cancer? Yeah. So facile route of administration differs depending on the outcome of the, right, how severe things are. Uh, how much are you willing, how much hassle, right, are you willing to endure in order to take the treatment depends on what the repercussions are, right, of not taking it. So with chemo, people are willing to drive across the country or fly across the country and sit in a chair and get IV drugs. Uh, but we're still working to not do that, right? We're still working to make drugs that are easier, okay? And lastly, we need a reasonable price. And again, here's where the modern drugs fail. The chemo drugs that, that uh, Farber and all those people developed in the 50s and 60s and 70s, those things don't cost much, certainly not anymore, right? They're, they're very low price. The new modern drugs can be $40,000 a month, $80,000, right, for a course of treatment or $100,000. Uh, and so they're very expensive. And we'll talk about a little bit uh, not immediately, but in a little bit, we'll actually talk about why they're so damn expensive, right? Because uh, we'll talk about how drugs are developed. Um, so they're very, very expensive, and it puts incredible strain on people if they don't have a very fortunate financial situation, right, with really good insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it can be uh, pretty much destroy everything, right? People can lose everything uh, to try to get a treatment, or they'll have to forego the treatment altogether, right, because they don't have the money. Yeah. Sure. I mean, well, it usually, so the, the, the drugs are covered at, at a certain level, right? So depending on your insurance, so if you're paying 20% copay and the drug is $100,000, right? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so it can still run up into huge numbers. The FDA-approved drugs pretty much are all covered by the private insurance or, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, which end up paying a lot of the cancer drug, right, because old people. <laughs> right? So uh, a lot of that, those are covered. The experimental drugs you don't usually pay for, right, almost never, because clinical trials, the pharmaceutical company or the consortium, whoever is putting the trial on, all those costs are covered. Right? So clinical trial is actually a way to get new treatment at no cost with more follow-up because they need to follow you really closely to look for side effects. So it's actually, and I'm sure Dr. El Reyes will talk about that, right? That's actually a plus of that whole thing. Okay. So uh, here is a, a quote uh, that perfectly describes chemotherapy, right? Uh, poisons and medicine are oftentimes the same substance given with different intents. Okay, uh, so a little bit of, of these drugs uh, can be used to treat a disease. Too much of it will kill you. And essentially, with all the traditional drugs that we're going to talk about now, what the docs do is push patients almost to the edge, right? They push them to the point where their bone marrow is suppressed, they're throwing up, their hair falls out. They get sores in their mouths. Sometimes you can't feel your feet. That may not come back, okay, depending on the drug. 
they're very, very nasty drugs, okay? very toxic. Uh, and, uh, but essentially, why would you take that? Because you don't have a choice. That's why, right? Because you say, if I don't take this, I know what will happen. Okay, so the anti-neoplastic drugs, right, new growth, neoplasia, uh, most of them are cytotoxic. And we're going to go through these. I'm going to show you a bunch, but don't memorize all the names and stuff like that. This is just for you to understand what we do to cells, okay? Uh, you don't have to know the, any brand name or the, or the names or anything like that. So there are alkylating agents. These are, these are chemicals that add small uh, groups, methyl groups or other small uh, organic groups to usually DNA. They can target other things as well. Uh, a good example is cisplatin, one of the very first chemotherapy drugs. It was actually discovered by a guy who was doing ex experiments with electricity. And he wanted to see what the effects were of putting electrodes into a culture with cells that were growing. And when he applied a little bit of current, the cells died. But he was a good enough scientist, kind of amazing actually, that he thought, well, maybe it wasn't the electricity. Maybe it changed the media somehow. And when he looked in it, it was platinum from the electrodes. Right? They were platinum electrodes. And it was the platinum that was killing the cells. And it actually became a cancer treatment very quickly. Um, so this platinum compound will cause intra-chain and interchain uh, linkage in DNA. So it covalently cross-links the DNA. You're not going to get replication or transcription that way. Right? Uh, so that's cisplatin. Right? Cyclophosphamide is another uh, alkylating agent. Then there are the drugs that are designed to starve the cell of necessary nutrients, usually those that are used to build DNA. That seems to be the primary target. And so methotrexate, uh, which looks like that, uh, this is an inhibitor of dihydrofolate reductase, which is in the uh, blocks the synthesis of DNA. We can use uh, pyrimidine analogs, like 5-FU, which blocks an enzyme called thymidylate synthase, which is involved, again, in the synthesis of the nucleotides. We can block the enzymes that uh, rotate DNA. What do topoisomerases do? Right? They allow for the, the untwisting, right? So when you, when you take DNA and you, if you have a twisted chain, picture this, and I put my fingers between that and I pull, this loop no longer has twists. Where do those twists go? Both directions, right? They migrate, so you get supercoiling. The topoisomerases cut the DNA and allow that, to, that stress to be relieved. But if you uh, interfere with those topoisomerases, such as this drug, which comes from this otherwise pretty, pretty flower, right? Here's the drug that comes from that. It's called etoposide. And it's a topoisomerase type 2 inhibitor. What the drug seems to do is to allow the topoisomerase to make the cut in the DNA, but it doesn't allow it to reseal it. So it turns the enzyme into a DNA chopping machine, right? Uh, and causes, causes some major DNA damage, right? Uh, topotecan, which comes from the not appropriately named happy tree, right, uh, is another topoisomerase inhibitor. Uh, it inhibits type 1 topoisomerases. Type 2 cut both strands. Type 1 cut one strand. Okay. So it's easy to remember. 1 is 1, 2 is 2. Okay. It's easy. Okay. Uh, and uh, here is uh, another one, adriamycin. Uh, right? Yeah. And this is adriamycin right here. This is called doxorubicin, or as I think I mentioned in class, patients refer to this as the red devil. It comes from a soil bacterium, and uh, this is extremely toxic uh, drug. So if you're getting an IV infusion of this and it leaks out, which can happen, right, uh, it will essentially just destroy that tissue, right? Uh, it, it's a very, very toxic drug. And so one of the things uh, that has been done with uh, adriamycin is to wrap it up in a bubble like this. This is a model of adriamycin. So the red stuff is the drug. Here is your lipid 
uh, bilayer, so the outside is the head group, so this is hydrophilic. It floats through the bloodstream. Uh, it bounces off of tissues. It doesn't cause any problem because this is what the tissues are seeing. When it gets inside the tumor, why would it accumulate in tumors? What's wrong with them? Leaky blood vessels, right? This stuff leaks out into the tumors, gets in the tumors, and ultimately gets taken up. The doxorubicin gets taken into the cell, and then it causes the damage in there, right? So without this wrapping, this drug causes irreparable heart damage, right? Uh, and it's one of the reasons I think I mentioned my, my wife didn't take chemo, right? Because they were going to give her this, and she was going to have permanent heart damage for the rest of her life. She was 39, right? Uh, she opted not to do that. You still have, it's not perfect. It, it's better. It's much better. But it's not perfect. Yeah, it's not perfect. Yeah? Um, no. Not really. I mean, I've never heard of anyone going, I'll take that one and not that one. Uh, so really, the, 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 the clinical trials, the approved treatments, are done either monotherapy, a single treatment, or combination therapies that have to go through extensive trials for each cancer type. It's, it's very, it's why it's so expensive. And, and so these things take a long time, and so then you get a combination which seems to work for breast cancer or pancreatic cancer, and that's what you take. So I've never heard of anyone who, let, let's say that the, the, the doc said, we want to give you these three. And I've never heard of anyone who said, well, I'll take those two, but I don't really want to take Doxel. I mean, that's not unreasonable, actually, but I've never heard of it. I'm, I'm not saying from a standpoint, I have a patient perspective, right? You may decide, I'm, I don't want the long term, you know, but I just don't ever hear that. People just either sort of go all in or not. <laughs> don't usually pick. Okay. Uh, there are uh, some chemotherapy agents Again, the, uh, they come from the Vinca plant, uh, both of these. This is something that you see all the time. It's an ornamental you see in Atlanta everywhere in the summer. You'll notice it now that you've seen this picture. Sometimes they're white, sometimes they're pink, uh, and it's called Vinca rosia. And Vinblast and, and Vincristin uh, are chemicals that are derived from that. And I don't know if I have a picture. Here's Vincristin. And what happens is that the Vinca uh, alkaloids, so again, these are organic chemicals from the plant. They bind to the tubulin dimers. And they don't allow the microtubules to polymerize. So you cannot make functional microtubules in the presence of this stuff. Okay? And you can see what that would do to cell division. Right? So that's, that's how these drugs work. Uh, the other drug that we talked about Taxol, this one that was discovered in the 60s, uh, and there is the Pacific yew tree, actually an endangered species. So for a long time, they couldn't get enough Taxol because the trees are actually limiting. Um, but now we can synthesize it. It looks like this. And it took a really long time to figure out how to make it. Okay, it was actually some people in Florida that finally came up with the uh, organic the synthesis of this chemical. You see, look at that, right? Good luck. Uh, <laughs> this is, isn't like, you know, methane. Right? Um, okay, so, so uh, they, they had the synthesized taxol. What taxol does is the exact opposite of what the vinca alkaloids do. It binds to polymerized tubulin, and it doesn't let it depolymerize. So it's a microtubule stabilizer. And it does not allow them to to un uh, right, to, to 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 fall apart, right? Which you need in order to have chromosome separation and cell division, right? And one of the things that we're that we're now learning about these drugs is they may be doing things that we don't know and didn't anticipate, like everything else in biology, right? Who wants to throw inflammation in here somewhere? Just take a guess, right? Okay. So uh, it, it seems like the anti-cancer, this is from 2013. So they've been using these things since the 40s and thinking they knew what they were doing. So fast forward till now, uh, we're starting to realize that these, these chemo drugs may be actually altering immune cells, uh, altering inflammatory uh, dendritic cells, and things like that. Right? So that by causing some damage, 
the cells may be uh, actually causing the death of the tumor because of immune cells. So what they find is that if you treat cell animals that are immunodeficient, they have different responses than, than animals that have a functioning immune system with the same chemo drug. So the immune system is involved in this response, right? It's not straight up chemo kills cancer cell, right? It, it doesn't seem to be working that way. And so how do we make things better? What, what are the different ways that chemo is given? Certainly people are trying to work with this stuff. It's ancient drugs, right, most of them. They're working with dosage. Combinations is probably the most common. Every day I see, if you wanted to, you could find at least a dozen different articles about new combinations of chemo drugs. And one reason for that is that they're really hoping they can come up with something new, obviously. Another is that you have two drugs that are already approved for use in humans. So it should be faster if you find out they work together, right? They already got approved. So uh, they're always looking to re recombine things and come up with new things. Uh, the route of administration, uh, intravenous oral peritoneal, uh, for ovarian cancer, one of the things they'll do, and colon cancer, I have a friend who had this done, they'll actually go in and they flood your uh, abdomen with heated, heated chemotherapy drugs. Right? It's called lavage, right? So they essentially flood the area to intensely treat uh, that area, but it's done during surgery, so this is obviously short-term exposure, but they'll, they'll, put, they'll fill the abdomen up uh, with that. Yep. <laughs> not, not that's really used. In experiments, they have all kinds of nanotechnology stuff to deliver things and pro-drugs and things, but in real life, not so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we want to, again, nanotechnology, which I just said, right? Sometimes people are talking about trying to encapsulate the drugs uh, in little beads and then deliver those beads to the tumors where they release, right, so that they don't hurt other stuff. So you get targeting, and people are looking at that. Also, timing, uh, something that was been neglected. When do you go to the doctor? When it's convenient for the doctor, right? When they're open. Not necessarily when your circadian rhythm means you're more likely to have dividing cells that be responsive to treatment. Uh, but they're looking into that now, right? That's something that people are looking at. Uh, because our cells are not active. You know, your beard grows different at night than it does during the day, right? Uh, it, everything's not the same. And so it may be that just doing longer infusion or doing it at a different time could have a better effect with the exact same drug. Right? So people are looking at that. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.